This is Pawn Zero to Hero. It's the third episode of the series and today we are going to take a look at Ghidra, a tool developed by the National Security Agency or the NSA of the United States. And this tool will help us make sense out of all this assembly nonsense. In the last episodes, we got introduced to the world of assembly, and we even manually reversed some assembly code in order to figure out what it does. If you haven't already seen those episodes, then be sure to check out the full Pawn Zero to Hero playlist, as we will be directly building upon that. Links can be found in the description down below. If after our last episodes, you found the task of making sense of assembly a bit laborious, then I would wholeheartedly agree with you. Because it is, but luckily you're not the first person to notice that. Hence why Ghidra saw the light of day. Ghidra is a decompiler. It does the exact opposite of a compiler. It takes machine code, known to us as assembly, and turns it into its source code. However, I shouldn't say that it does the exact opposite of a compiler, I should say that it tries to do the exact opposite of a compiler. Because the process of compiling and decompiling code isn't a one-to-one -one function, hence why the decompiler will not always 100% be correct. However, that does not mean that having a fairly correct version of the source code isn't helpful. In fact, it is incredibly helpful and I will be showcasing that today. But before we get going, I'd like to quickly say one last thing, and that is that I really enjoy making these videos and producing this free educational content. However, in order to make it reasonable for me to create these, I'm going to say that I will always continue this series if this episode gets at least 1000 views in a week. So if you want to see more videos in the Pawn Zero Two Hero series, then please do consider sharing it on Twitter with your friends or anywhere else to support me in creating this free content. But with that out of the way, we can get into the video, starting with a short section on installing Ghidra. You are going to want to play around with this tool, so let's get going and install it. If you have a Kali machine, then this process is incredibly simple. All you have to do is run sudo opt install Ghidra, and that really is it. If you're not using Kali, however, do not worry, as installing it on other distributions or operating systems is not hard at all. Just go to the releases page on GitHub, download the zip file, unzip it, and run the Ghidra run file, or the Ghidra run.bat file if you're on Windows. One last small note is that you will need to have the Java Development Kit, or JDK 11, installed on your system. But that's it, now you should see a window as shown here, and let's reverse a simple binary using Ghidra. We are going to reverse a binary from crackmes.1 a great website to train your reversing skills. So I've downloaded Please Crack Me by RevDev, and running it, we see that it asks for a username, a number between one and nine, and then a password. But our password is wrong. Let's take a look at this one in Ghidra and see if we can figure it out. Over in Ghidra, we've ended up at this screen again. This is the project manager. In order to analyze our binary, we need to create a project through file new project. Ghidra will now ask us for a project type. We can choose between non-shared and shared. In our case, we're going to select non-shared, but it's useful to know what the shared option is and that it exists. As discussed earlier, Ghidra was created by the NSA. Their use case is having big reverse engineering teams look through incredibly complex binaries and in this case, a form of collaboration is very, very useful. Shared projects operate very similarly to Git repositories, where you can work on a binary, make changes, annotations, etc., and then push those changes to a server so your team members can continue working on your version. Uh, but we're not going to go into more depth here, but feel free to comment down below if you would like to see a standalone video on shared Ghidra projects. But now it's time to give our project a name and a directory to live in. These can be arbitrarily chosen, and doing so takes us back to the project manager screen, where we can now finally import the binary into our project. To do so, go to File, Import File, or drag your binary into the window. 
Doing so will bring up the import dialog and here you can change things such as the file format and the language. However, luckily Ghidra already does some detecting on your binary and fills them out. And in most cases, Ghidra will be correct here. And most of the time you shouldn't be worried with changing them. However, if you ever see that things start to look strange when moving forward from here, this might be a place to check, to double check if Ghidra was right. So we're going to move on with the default settings by pressing OK and letting Ghidra import our binary. After the import, a summary of it gets shown onto the screen and here you can find a bunch more information about the binary. At the bottom, you can also see some additional info such as uh, in this case, a missing lib C and some unresolved external symbols. In most cases, this doesn't really matter, but it's a great place to check if you're encountering some unexpected results. We've now successfully imported our first binary. Let's analyze it. We can analyze this binary by double clicking on it and this will open the code browser. After we wait a second for it to open, Ghidra comes at us with the message that please crack me has not been analyzed, would you like to analyze it now? Well yes Ghidra, that's exactly what I'd like to do, so I click yes. That opens the analysis options dialog. Here we can select and modify the analyzers that we want to run. A bunch of these cover incredibly difficult and complex stuff that requires a very deep understanding of everything underlying binaries. But luckily we don't need to go too deep into any of this. In fact, I pretty much always like to use the default options here, but just for good sake, let's take a quick look at the options for the ASCII strings analyzer which searches for valid ASCII strings and automatically creates them in the binary. Here you can change things such as the minimum string length it has to find, whether or not strings require null termination and much more. But we are happy with these default settings for all of the analyzers. So let's just press the analyze button. The analysis in this case happens incredibly quickly because our binary is tiny. However, with large binaries, this can take a couple minutes. Now you can see that there are a ton of buttons, panes, options and views here because Ghidra allows you to do incredibly complex stuff. But for today's video, we're going to focus on the three most important views in my opinion. Uh, however, feel free to play around with the other ones on your own. And if we ever need anything from another window, then we will be sure to look into it in more depth then. But for now, let's focus on the listing view, the symbol tree and the decompiler pane. Starting off with the listing view. This is where you can find the bytes, the assembly codes, the data and all that. Your very basic main view. Next up, we have the symbol tree and this is where we can find all the, well, symbols. Things like imports, exports, functions, labels, classes and namespaces. However, in reality, the function list is the one where we will be spending the most of our time. In this case, we can, for example, see the main function in there, which we are for sure going to want to assess. Lastly, we have the decompile window, which shows the decompiled code of the selected function. In this case, the main function. These views don't just display simple text. No. For one, they are very closely connected. For example, if I click on a line of code in the disassembler, it would automatically jump to the matching assembly code and highlight it in the listing view. If I hover my mouse over a number, a string, a function, a variable or anything else, then you can see a little pop-up that shows more information about that object. Now that we have an understanding of what all of these Ghidra windows are doing, let's start reversing this binary. Time to take a look at how Ghidra can help us to efficiently reverse this binary. We're going to start off with the declarations of several variables. All of these are stored on the stack as we've learned in earlier episodes, uh, but the names of these variables makes no sense at all. But obviously Ghidra has no idea about what this binary is actually for. It lacks that context. However, in a bit we can give it that context. And then we move on to the first actual statement here which already doesn't really make much sense to me. Is this supposed to be the helpful decompiled code that I was talking about? Well, in this case, it's a little hard to see what's going on, but looking at the assembly, we can see that we're storing a value into RAX and then pushing it onto the stack. If we only had the assembly available to us, it would be pretty hard to see where this variable gets used again, but luckily we have the decompiled code the local 20 variable only gets used in the last lines of the function, 
which is going to do an if check and then call stack check fail. What does all of that mean? This is in essence a stack canary. Canaries are something that we will cover in much more depth in the future, but for now, all you need to know is that it's a protection helping to make exploiting buffer overflows way more difficult. A bunch more videos down the line, we will be dreading these canaries. But now that we know that, let's mark it in Ghidra. I would like to rename local 20 to canary. So let's right click, select rename and do just that. Now I'd like to add a comment here saying create canary and a comment down below saying check canary. We can do that by right clicking, going to comments and setting a pre comment. That will look like this. That was pretty hard, but luckily things start to get easier from here on out. The next statement, for example, is a printf. Printing out, type in your username to the screen. Then we have a scanf. The ISO C99 part can be practically ignored. Since we haven't discussed scanf yet, here's a short primer. Scanf is the opposite of printf. Printf will take in arguments, put it in a format, and then print it out. Scanf will take input from standard in, so user input, put that in a format and store it in a variable. So in this case, we're taking in data from standard in, formatting that according to DAT 00102020, and storing the result in local 78. But what is that that thing? Let's double click it and now in our listing view, we see that it's pretty much just percentage %s. Where does our input get stored? Well, in local 78, but let's rename that to user input. The following two instructions ask us for a number between one and nine. This time our scanf format is percentage %d. I've also renamed local 80 here. But now we reach an if statement saying that if our input is smaller than one, it's going to output an error and set the uvar2 variable to a very high number. This variable is returned in the end of the main function, so this is the exit status of our program, which should be zero when the program ran successfully and something different when an error occurred. Um, but let's also rename this variable for future reference. Now we reach another if statement for when our number is smaller than 10. In that case, we're going to set a variable to zero and start a while loop. In that while loop, we take the length of our username and check that it's bigger than the variable. We just set to zero. If that's not the case, then we break out of the loop. And later on, we also see that this variable gets incremented by one in every iteration of the loop. In essence, we're just looping over our username here. But let's rename these variables as well. But what are we actually doing in this loop? Well, that's described here. We're assigning to a buffer local 58, which from looking at the declarations is the same size as the username. What are we storing here? Well, we're adding our number input to our username input and storing that. After that, our loop completes and we get asked to enter a password. So to recap, the loop pretty much just takes in every letter of our username and adds our number to that. But following that loop, the program will compare the modified username we created in the loop and the password input. If they are equal, it will tell us that we've successfully logged in. And if not, it will tell us that the password was wrong. Now that we fully understand how the password gets created, Let's see if we can create a username and password that will log us in. Let's do this in Python. I would like for my username to be Pink Draconian and my number to be five. So the password simply is the number five added to each letter of my username. So let's do that. Obviously we can't just add a number to a string in Python. We need to convert our letter to an integer using ORD and we can turn it back into a letter using CHR. Let's take a look at what my password is. It's unspoof something. Well, anyways, time to try it out. And after entering all the information, we see that indeed we have successfully logged in. And that is all for today's video. Today we took a look at the Ghidra tool. We covered some of its features, mainly the ones that we will be using the most. It's impossible to learn and understand the capabilities of a tool without actually using it and playing around with it. 
which is why we took up a challenge and solved our first crack meet. We noticed that the decompiler view gave us the ability to reverse this binary with a much higher efficiency. I encourage all of you to head over to crackmes.1 and download some easier ones with a difficulty level between 1 and 2 uh, and go and reverse them. But so far we've always dealt with files in a static way where we assess the code and then run it all at once. However, there are also ways of dynamically assessing the code. In this case, you can do things such as run through a certain part of the program until you reach some assembly that you want to assess. Then you can pause the program to check everything out and continue execution whenever you see that fit. Our next video is going to be all about GDB and dynamically reversing, so definitely stay tuned for that one. As I've explained in the beginning of this video, that next video will come for sure if we can get a thousand views on this video within the next week. So be sure to share it so we reach that goal as I would really, really love to continue this series and get more people into the world of binary exploitation. With all that being said, however, we've reached the end of the third episode of this series. Click the like button if you liked the video and be sure to comment any questions, concerns or just nice things down below. That's it for me. I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope to see you back for the next one.